Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to today's very special session. My name is Nellie Deutsch, and I'm going to be uh, moderating and staying in the background as our speaker speaks. If you could just add in the chat box where you're from as we go, just so that we get an idea of uh, where everyone's from. People will be coming in as we go, so uh, that's okay. I'm also recording this, and I will be uh, uploading it to YouTube without anybody's names, so that should be fine. All right, so um, let me introduce our speaker. All right. So Dr. Dean Radden, a PhD, is a chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, IONS. And if you don't know much about it, um, you'll hear a lot and learn as you go. Uh, you can read it. I've added this to the uh, course area so that you can see exactly uh, who the speaker is. Um, Dr. Dean Radden is no stranger. He appeared in a movie called What the Bleep. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Uh, you can let me know in the chat box if you've seen it. Uh, he is uh, the author of many books and he's given over 200 interviews. So he um, has spoken quite a bit and uh, he's well sought after. So we're really privileged to have you with us. Uh, this is his latest book. He's going to be talking about it. So you can see I purchased it. It's called Supernormal. Another book that you will find very exciting is called Entangled Minds. So just uh, to give you an idea, I'm going to pass on the mic to um, Dean, who's going to be screen sharing today. Feel free to use the chat box to ask questions. You can also copy uh, the chat box at the end. Notice that I've added uh, the code so that you can get your badge for this live session through Connected Educators from the United States Department of Education. So you've got all the links up at the top and you can do that later on. Okay, so I'm going to uh, pass on the mic and the tools. There we go. If you're not able to see the webcam, don't worry, that's probably your connection and it will get better. All right, so great to see you. I don't hear you. Thank yet. you. Can you hear me now? Very well. Oh, good. Okay, so uh, you're going yeah, to... Yeah, I look a little shirt. bit... You look like, different? You don't recognize yourself? Well, I look different in the uh, the picture on that screen, uh, but mainly because I have different glasses. And you've got a headset, uh, which makes a huge That's difference. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you are going to screen share, am I correct? So... Um, That's correct. And you know exactly, uh, you've got everything set up. Uh, Yep. Okay, great. Uh, the screen share button is not uh, clickable, so I can't share anything yet. Oh no, I gave. I, you're right because I gave right to Karen. Right now, I can. Now yeah, I can do it. Sorry about that. My fault. Shall I go ahead and do it? Yes, please. All right. Now, when uh, the screen sharing starts, generally the uh, person who's screen sharing uh, freezes. You can't hear them. And okay, here we go. You may find that everything has moved to the bottom. Don't worry about that. Okay, we're back in class. You have to go back. I guess it threw you off. It happens sometimes. Can, all right. Can you can you see my screen now? Was Buddha yes. just a nice guy? All right. I'm gonna make it a little bit larger. Okay. So I'm I'm all set to go. We hear you well. Okay. 
my talk is was Buddha just a nice guy? Uh, this is the the reason for this question will become clearer as we go along. So the three ways of thinking about uh, answering this question, and they all have to do with what we think the nature of consciousness is about. So the three ways of thinking about consciousness. One way, which is popular in the neurosciences, is that consciousness is generated by the brain. There's an enormous amount of evidence that something like that is true. And what we, what we see are, uh, in the neurosciences, we look at this object, and we're interested in understanding how is it that thought and cognition and emotion arise from that kind of structure. And while we've learned quite a bit about the mechanics of what's going on at the neuronal level, we don't actually see anything that looks like consciousness there. I'm talking about self-reflective awareness. You, you, don't, you see physical stuff. You don't see awareness itself. So nevertheless, if you look at things as subtle as ethics and the feeling of morality, that there are areas of the brain that are associated with those subtle phenomena. And in fact, if you use a functional MRI, you can find that certain areas of the brain are involved in things like perceiving the intentions and the morality of others. And in addition, there are so-called circuits in the brain, different areas of the brain that uh, correspond to each other that are active when uh, people are feeling empathy or in interpreting what others uh, are talking about in of uh, empathy. So there's quite a bit of evidence suggesting that some aspects of consciousness are, in fact, generated by the brain. So it gives rise to a picture like this. So here's the brain. And basically, we're like robots. And our understanding of our consciousness and our awareness then takes on kind of a mechanical view. This is what the neuroscientists tell us about our, our inner selves. Well, that's, that's one way of thinking about it. Another way is that brain activity reflects consciousness. And this is more along the lines of the brain is a kind of a filter for awareness, which is outside of us somehow. It's like fundamentally part of the substance of the universe, and the brain filters it out. So that comes not so much from the scientific traditions, but from the contemplative traditions. So when you sit down and you quiet your mind for a while, you begin to get the sense that, uh, that the physical world is more illusory than you would if you started from a scientific perspective. we know in terms of uh, brain producing or receiving something as ephemeral as the idea of God, it turns out that there are a number of ways of doing that. There are certain chemicals that are associated with mystical experience. There are certain areas of the brain that are associated with mystical experience. Some people are spiritual virtuosos and are very a easily able to get into these mystical states. Uh, there's a whole literature on the biology of belief, a different biology associated with uh, belief in, and experience in mystical states, and of course, phenomena like near-death experience. So when you combine all of those together, what you end up with is more a picture that looks a little bit like this, where you have the same object as we saw before, but now we think of it more as kind of a screen or as a television or a radio set that is projecting images, but the awareness that is watching the screen is actually not the brain. It's outside. So that's a different view. Then there's a third view. The third view is something like this. That this is, of course, the traditional notion of chakras or subtle energies or multiple bodies that people have. Very little is actually understood in terms of, from a scientific perspective, of these kinds of phenomena. 
So they have lots of different names associated with these kinds of energies, from chi to prana to kundalini and so on. Again, from a science perspective, we don't know very much about this, but it is may it seems to be relevant to this question of what about consciousness? So those are the three ways to go about it, at least in the Western world, when we encounter the stories about our religious figures, the, they always seem to be embellished beyond the point where we can believe it. So this is a picture of Buddha uh, levitating in a pillar of flame among his uh, disciples. Uh, and here we have Charlton Heston, the actor who is parting the Red Sea. Uh, here we have Jesus walking on water. The reason I show these is because all of our religious traditions and our, our major religious figures are renowned and their teachings last for a long time because of the supernatural miracles associated with them. That our sense is that they must have known something. They carry a certain sense of truth about what they're saying because they're able to do things that ordinary people are not able to do. Well, from, from the general population perspective, this is fine. From a scientific perspective, we don't know what to do with this at all. They look, they look like stories, basically. And it gives rise to a reaction, a secular reaction. So maybe the parting of the Red Sea was a fluke. It was just an accident. Or this caption, I'm glad my name's not thou. This is another kind of reaction uh, to the religious lore. Another is this famous uh, grilled cheese sandwich with the uh, image of either Jesus or Mona Lisa or Mother Mary impressed in the grilled cheese sandwich. Uh, there are many, many miracles that are associated with things like this, and there's a whole website devoted to them called StuffThatLooksLikeJesus.com. And it shows not only grilled, ce grilled cheese sandwiches, but lots of images that people claim are associated with uh, with spiritual figures that are giving them a message in some way. This particular one was eventually sold to a casino in Las Vegas that has it on display. Uh, my favorite one is that if you're too busy to meditate, you can use the Buddha patch uh, and achieve enlightenment while you clean your toilet. Also available in capsule, gel, and suppository form. And my all-time favorite is this one. If there is no God, how come the world fits so perfectly into a chicken? That can't be a coincidence. So these are the, the, the secular reaction to stories about our religious figures that, from a scientific perspective, seem at best like stories or superstition. So it brings us back to this question, was Buddha just a nice guy? And I could have chosen any religious figure, but Buddha seems to be a nice neutral one to use. I'm sure he wouldn't mind. Buddha, of course, is a, a title. And so we'll instead talk about the man, Siddhartha. So was Siddhartha just a, a nice guy? Maybe he was the George Clooney of his day. He was like a movie star. He was handsomer than the usual person. And he knew how to work a crowd. And he had a good smile. Was that enough to have his teachings last for several thousand years? Or is there something else going on? And so I'm, I'm a scientist. My, my interest in this case is I look at these figures and wonder, is it just simply something like movie star charisma, or is there something else? What is the something else? At the institute that I, I've worked now is uh, we're interested in these kinds of phenomena from a scientific perspective. We look at mystical experiences, psychic experiences, spiritual experiences, and try to understand using the tools of science what is happening when people talk about these experiences. The question about Buddha comes up, and it has come up explicitly in dialogues with the Dalai Lama. The Mind and Life Institute has sponsored dialogues between the Tibetan Buddhists and Western scientists where they try to look for ways to dialogue between what the two traditions are telling us about the nature of reality. And what you find as a result is there are now lots of books that are being written about the blissful brain, powering up your brain, about the effect of meditation on the cortex, about putting uh, monks in uh, functional MRIs and putting get, measuring EEGs. This is a relatively new area of, of science, and it's considered to be mainstream now 
which is great because it means that finally science can begin to address the kinds of questions that we've been interested in for 40 years now. What do we make of stories that don't seem to fit in with the rest of science? And in particular, the, the aspect of this that I'm interested in are the supernormal abilities. We're talking here mainly about psychic abilities, but also ones that go beyond psychic. They're sometimes considered to be divine gifts, uh, or at least latent human potentials that are not often expressed. Uh, the lady uh, on the left here, is, her name is Selma Sirik. She's an illustrator that I hired to make drawings of super hero comic book type figures doing yoga poses. And that's my, my connection then in the book was to show how we're, we're dealing with something which seems like comic book information, but maybe beyond that. So one another way then of getting into this issue is we can ask, well, what what is the likely course of human evolution? This is part of a famous sequence that we're, we're monkeys, and then we're cavemen, and then we're modern man, and then we're becoming a super modern man, and then we turn into that. And that, that unfortunately is one of the directions that uh, we seem to be headed towards. But there's a more optimistic evolution, and that's this one. This comes uh, somewhat out of the Vedas, in which we go from uh, simians to sapiens to siddhas, the, uh, an advanced form of humanity uh, where by 20, 20, 25, 25, we learn how to, to hover, and 7,000 years later, we learn how to fly. So I, I think I like that potential evolution a little bit better, and it gives us a different sense of the possible potentials that, that we uh, have. This is not a scientific uh, projection. It's more like a projection based on, on Vedic lore. But again, we can ask, we don't really know what's what's going to happen in our evolutionary path. Is it possible that that's what's going to happen? So we'll look at it this way. So uh, the way that I, I'll talk about it then is through yoga. Uh, yoga, as I, I've selected because, uh, at least within the West and many other places in the world now, yoga is part of popular culture. Uh, we know that in the United States because the cover of Time magazine shows that yoga and meditation are, are front page, front cover issues. And this is already uh, between 10 and, and 13 years old now. So it's very dead, dead center mainstream. And that, that's important. And one of the consequences of it is that there's more and more scientific studies looking at the health benefits, both mental and physical health benefits of yoga and meditation. For example, we know that for something, uh, for things that are difficult to treat, like carpal tunnel and, and back pain and post-traumatic stress, depression, insomnia, that yoga and meditation are as good, if not better, than other methods, including drugs. So it, it's being used now um, and paid for by insurance companies because it's so effective. So that's one reason I'm talking about yoga. Uh, another reason is that it's so popular that it has basically become almost a cartoon now uh, where everyone has stopped jogging and now we're all doing yoga poses. So let's look at uh, the classical yoga, not yoga as practiced in the West generally, but the yoga sutras of the Indian sage Patanjali. Uh, the, the sutras are four short books with 196 sutras or, or aphorisms. Uh, it consists primarily talking about the goal of yoga, which is to achieve a deeply absorbed meditative state called samadhi. So samadhi is uh, one way of thinking about when people talk of a mystical experience, what they mean is, is samadhi. This is the, the yogic term for it. Samadhi, uh, in the process of the, uh, doing the disciplines in order to develop it, which is this deep meditative state, you begin to exhibit the cities. The cities is a, a Sanskrit term meaning perfection or attainment, and it's basically the yoga superpowers. The third book of the yoga sutras is devoted to these abilities. 
uh, to develop something like telepathy, there is basically a prescription given or a description within the Yoga Sutras and you use a process called Samyama or Sanyama which is a combination of concentration, meditation and absorption along with an object of your attention. So if you wanted to have telepathy with somebody you do Samyama on that person, you become fully absorbed into that person and as a result you know them, you know their thoughts, you know everything else about them as well. So this same this whole book, the Vibhuti Pada, uh, within the Yoga Sutras is a taxonomy and an instruction book, in a sense, of how to create these yoga superpowers. Well, from a scientific perspective, uh, it, it looks like fairy tales because it's talking about psychic and beyond psychic experiences that don't make any sense from a science perspective. Nevertheless, you can look at them and say, well, what is, what's being described? Uh, there are three categories of cities that are described. Uh, one category called mind-body connections. Uh, these are things like healing, exceptional healing, inedia, meaning not having to eat, super strength, super speed, levitation, and the opposite of levitation, which is gravitation, being so heavy that you can't be moved. The primary category of cities is clairvoyance, perception through space or time. And a smaller category is psychokinesis, or direct mind over matter interaction effects. The same cities are found in all cultures. For example, in, in yoga, we, we mention it's city and Catholicism are called the charisms. It, you find it in Islam and Judaism and Tibetan Buddhism, all shamanic traditions. They all basically describe the same kinds of special powers. In some cases, they're described as something that is divine, that these are special gifts for you, and other traditions like yoga, these are, these are thought to be inherent capacities that you can develop yourself. So that's the Yoga Sutras. Well, what do we do about that? Yoga Sutra uh, Book 3, Numbers 19 and 20, talk about the knowledge of other people's minds. So here's how science has looked at this issue. In the laboratory, we use a method called the Gansfeld telepathy experiment. Uh, here is a, a friend of mine named Gail who's having uh, a half of a ping pong ball put over each eye and it's taped in place. And there's my assistant, Lena, who's setting her up. Uh, and Gail has a red light shining in her eyes and she's told to keep her eyes open. And so what, if you imagine in, you're in that position, everywhere you look, all you can see is red. You just see a red light. We also then give Gail headphones to wear that play white noise. So she can't see or hear anything except unpatterned redness and white noise. If you're in this state for more than around 10 minutes, you begin to hallucinate in a dreamlike way, very similar to what happens uh, when you're falling asleep. You go into a hypnagogic state. And this is by design in the experiment because we want people to become very sensitive to internal subjective impressions. Why? Because we have a person at a distance who will send to her one of four pictures that is selected at random. So we have four pictures. One of these was selected at random. So by chance, later, Gail has to guess which one she thinks the sender was trying to send to her mentally. And she doesn't know which one it is. So one of them is selected uh, by chance. She would guess it one of four times. And here's what Gail actually said. Uh, in this experiment. Something has a rough texture, tall looking up high, like in an art gallery, a Yosemite kind of image of a tall rock. Yosemite is a, a famous uh, national park in California. It's monolithic. Images of Mount Rushmore, which is another famous thing in a, in a uh, national park in the U.S. Half dome, which is in the Yosemite park, like a big stone. See, there, these are all large stone-like things. So Gail is then taken out of the Gansfeld condition. She's shown four pictures. She has to match her impressions with what she thought the sender was sending mentally later. Uh, and this was the image that was being sent. And basically, the pyramids are a large rock, like what you'd see in an art gallery. Uh, and, and it's monolithic. Well, that's one session. This is showing 
4,674 sessions that are based on the same general idea, the same kind of experiment, but 4,674 of them. And this shows it in terms of 122 published experiments from 20 laboratories around the world over the past 40 years. So chance is the dotted line, 25%. Uh, you can kind of see your eyeball can tell you that the overall hit rate is not 25%, but a little bit over. So if we look at the, the average hit rate over all of these sessions, remember, each session is like the one that Gail did, where she has to guess which was the target that was being mentally sent. The overall hit rate is 32%. And chance is 25%. Well, what are the odds against chance of, of getting that difference? It's, it's this. The odds against chance is 300 trillion quadrillion to 1. What does that mean? That means that the likelihood that, that the receivers in this telepathy experiment are able to correctly guess the right target that was being sent to them from a distance is 300 trillion quadrillion to 1. That means we're, we have very high certainty that telepathy exists. This has been discussed repeatedly in the academic literature in, in a journal called Psychological Bulletin. It was just one of the top-rated uh, journals in psychology. And while it's not fully accepted by most psychologists, the fact that it is repeatedly discussed in the psychological literature shows that, in a sense, this is now considered part of a mainstream dialogue. Whenever you do an experiment of this type, or any type, you have to be sure that uh, you're, not, um, you're not making a mistake in terms of how you interpret what these results are. So maybe there was some kind of a leakage of information between people, or recording mistakes, or randomization problems, and so on. All of these have been looked at in great detail, and uh, including skeptics who are familiar with this literature, they agree that it is not any of these explanations. One, ex one possible explanation, then, is this, that uh, it has often been said that uh, people who are very skeptical about these ideas can't replicate the result, which, of course, would be suspicious, because then you think maybe people are not skeptical or are making mistakes. Well, up until a few years ago, there was no response to this, because skeptics don't do these experiments. Well, a couple of them did. Uh, a professor at the University of Georgia and another at the University of Notre Dame uh, did the same kind of Gansfeld telepathy experiment as I just described. And what they were did was this. After eight studies, we had an overall statistically significant hit rate of 32%. This is the same hit rate that we have seen in the 122 publications previously. Uh, but it was precariously close to demonstrating humans do have psychic powers. So in spite of the fact that these uh, these investigators did the experiments, got the same result as everybody else, they still didn't believe it. And among other things, it shows that if you start from a position of skepticism, which is so skeptical that you, you're no longer open to the possibility that the effect is real, then no evidence will change your mind, even evidence that you produce yourself. And from my perspective, that's no longer a scientific position. That's a position of prejudice. So, does telepathy exist? Now remember, the reason for I'm mentioning this is because telepathy is mentioned explicitly in the Yoga Sutras. This is, is part of this ancient uh, legends about what happens when you do advanced meditative practice. So does telepathy exist? Well, there is converging repeatable evidence from many studies over the years that telepathy exists beyond a reasonable doubt. What I haven't mentioned here are several other classes of experiment that all of which show in different ways, including neuroscience ways, that telepathy exists. So are you not thinking what I'm not thinking? We should remember that there are uh, many traditions that are not scientific traditions except telepathy as a given, uh, primarily because of experiences that people report. Science, of course, is very skeptical about experiences that people report because a lot of times people are mistaken. That's why we do experiments of this type under controlled conditions so we're able to tell with high confidence that these effects are what they appear to be. Now let's consider another area of, mind, of uh, the cities talking about mind-matter interaction. 
Uh, these are a little bit more controversial and immediately say that we're not going to talk about spoon bending. We're going to talk about uh, the way that these kinds of phenomena are studied in the laboratory. So in the laboratory, one way of approaching this, the way that, that has been studied most uh, over the past 50 years or so, is uh, a, an effect that is, is well, under, well known but not very well understood within quantum mechanics, which is that the, the nature of observation or knowledge, or measurement, information, those concepts change the way that, that quantum effects uh, are uh, manifest. Uh, the way that it's most simply seen is that if you take a photon or electron or some other uh, elementary particle and you send them through two tiny little slits and you have a camera at the other end and it measures where do, this, where do these particles end up. Well, if you, if you don't look, if you don't know which slit, say, that the photon goes through, you end up with what's called an interference pattern. You have a, a certain uh, form of um, distribution of the light that the camera sees and, and alternating light and dark bands. But the moment that you look and that you know which slit the photon goes through, you get a very different pattern. And so it almost seems as though the, the, the photon knows that somebody's looking. So we took advantage of this effect, the quantum observer effect, and created a double slit optical system using this conventional uh, apparatus. And we did one thing that was a little bit different. Rather than using a, a conventional uh, form of detector, in physics you'd use a, an optical detector, we asked people instead to use their mind's eye as a detector, just to use their mind. And so uh, the detector normally, if in a physics experiment, you'd put the detector in the vicinity of the double slit and you would use it to get information about which of the two slits that a photon goes through. That's, that's the basic experiment. We're asking people to use their mind's eye to act like a detector and see if they can, purely by thinking about it, imagine which of the two slits a photon goes through. If they're able to do that, then we know through the quantum observer effect that we would get a change in the interference pattern. So here's the experimental apparatus. Uh, and the tube on the left is a part of a laser. Uh, within the box, it's a, uh, there's a double slit. There's a very sensitive camera. It's all optically sealed. It's all run by a computer. There I am working on the, the innards of the device. And I'm skipping over about an hour's worth of explanation here, but just uh, giving you the, the final result. The prediction in this case is that uh, the act of observing the double slit with your mind will cause the interference pattern to change in a way that will give a negative number. Okay, it's a, talking about collapse of the wave function for those of you who know about that idea. And that, that would give a negative number. And so on the bottom of this graph is showing the, the statistical results after 250 sessions that have been run by about 100 people. Going down is the direction that we predict. And statistically speaking, this is a highly significant result. The graph on the top, the line on the top, shows what happens when people are not looking at the system. So that's a control condition to make sure that there's n nothing, there's no artifact that is causing this result. So when you do the statistics on this, you find not only that meditators do better than non-meditators, uh, but uh, that they're, they're more consistent in terms of the results that they end up getting. So meditators in this case got odds against chance of almost 300,000 to 1 against chance. Uh, the reason why we think meditators do better is because they're able to attend to the target. The target in this case, remember, is just purely mentally think about what's going on in the double slit system. Non-meditators can't do that very well, and so they don't get as good a score. Uh, we published this result in physics essays last year, and we submitted and just got uh, uh, confirmation that our second paper will also appear in, uh, in physics essays. So uh, th these studies were designed and conducted as physics experiments, which is why we ended up publishing it in the physics journal. Uh, but it's, it's not just physics. It's, it's more about uh, what we might call psychophysics 
It's the interaction between mind and matter. Well, what about the stories? Well, what about the stories of the other cities? Uh, the, we we're talking about things which, from a, a scientific perspective, are like Superman. Well, what do we think about those? Well, some of these I think we have we know now with high confidence. So I already mentioned a little bit about telepathy. I could have spent another hour talking about experiments looking at clairvoyance, or precognition, or psychokinesis. There are certain commonalities about these effects. First of all, let's see. First of all, the one commonality about all of these phenomena is that they appear to be independent of space and time in the usual way. This is primarily the reason why it's so difficult from a scientific perspective to accept. When we think about a classical physics view of the world, it's, it's like a common sense view of the world, uh, we hardly ever see anything which is independent of space and time. And yet we know from relativity theory, we know from quantum mechanics, that space and time are special cases of a, of a much stranger reality that we actually do live in. Another commonality is that all of these phenomena don't magically descend upon you out of the sky. Uh, when we test somebody in the laboratory, all we ask them to do is do some kind of a task in what amounts to a psychology experiment, sometimes a physics experiment. So we would rather call this a first sense rather than a sixth sense. It's not something that is added on to existing senses. It seems to come before. It's something that is like an unconscious thing in the background. We know from lots of experiments that these phenomena are modulated by talent, by experience, by belief, by emotion, empathy, motivation, openness. When you do personality uh, tests of people's temperament, some people fall very clearly into a kind of a, a skeptical temperament. They just don't accept things very readily. And those people tend not to have these kinds of experiences very often. You look at other kinds of temperaments where people are very open to things, they tend to believe things easily, they tend to have these experiences much more. Well, the question then is, well, maybe the, the skeptics are not seeing them because these effects don't exist. Whereas the other people who are open to things, they see it all the time, but they're mistaking it. Again, this is exactly the reason why we do experiments, so we're able to get rid of the biasing effects of individual beliefs. And as I pointed out, even skeptics who ex said they did not believe in psychic phenomena, when doing these as science experiments, they end up getting the same results that has been seen for 40 years. That, and by the way, those results are the, the same results suggesting that telepathy is in fact true. There's a, a smaller literature now suggesting that uh, the right temporal lobe of the brain, this portion of the brain over here, is associated in some way with uh, the, these kinds of phenomena. So what's, the so what's the science response to the cities? Well, it's good luck getting it peer reviewed. Uh, this is because uh, scientists by temperament are most skeptical. They tend to, to imagine that things like telepathy and, and precognition cannot exist. Uh, and yet, empirically, I'm talking about the scientific experimental database now, empirically, we're pretty sure that these things do exist. But everybody likes to have an explanation. Uh, and uh, there we go. So uh, the way science is supposed to work is that we follow the data. If some people re require an explanation first, in spite of the data, and then you get stuck because if we only did that, if we only accepted new data and new experiments based on things that were understood in a theoretical sense, all of science would stop. It would stop dead today, and we can finish writing about our textbooks. So we know that we, we, our theories are not, in some cases, they're not correct. In some cases, they're not comprehensive enough. And this is why we continually revise textbooks, because we're learning more and more about the way the world works. So here's my conclusions. First of all, from a, a pure empirical perspective, we, we now know that some of the cities, as described 2,000 years ago by Patanjali, some of them do exist. 
So the, what we're seeing in the yogic lore, at least of what we've been able to study, is not fairy tales. Some of it was actually true. The second thing is that most of the cities, as described in the historical lore, have not been systematically studied. So we, we really, science cannot say anything about, for example, whether levitation is possible. We haven't found anybody who's able to levitate on demand under control conditions, so we don't know. To get a, a theoretical explanation that will be satisfying uh, and, and not violate what we know to be true through the rest of science will require major advancements in the neurosciences and probably in physics as well. Uh, can we expect that there will be major advancements? Absolutely. Uh, every, every day, practically, there are new discoveries within all of the scientific domains, including neurosciences and physics. And the, the, the thing which I think is most interesting is that the uh, eventually the direction, especially the direction that physics has gone in the past 150 years. If you were go to go back 150 years ago and ask a physicist, do you think something like telepathy is possible or is precognition possible? Even though we don't understand fully, is it possible? The answer would be no, it's not even possible. Why? Because there's nothing that transcends space and time that we know of. Well, we're 150 years later now, and we know a lot of things, all kinds of things that transcend space and time. Between relativity theory, which we have to use, for example, to make GPS systems work because the timing is so precise that relativistic effects are important, and quantum mechanics, where entanglement is not only known to be real, but is being used in applications now, and apparently involves non-local connections through space and time, we can no longer say that these kinds of effects are impossible. Through the advancement of physics, we know that it is possible. What's missing is an explanation that brings these elementary effects in physics up to the level of human experience. We don't know how to do that yet. Uh, from, since I've been studying these kinds of phenomena in the laboratory, I'm pretty well convinced that they're real. And so my suspicion is that in another 20 to 50 years, that uh, physics and the neurosciences will have advanced to the point where not only will we see that these effects are possible, but we will begin to see plausible ways of understanding what's going on. Another thing to, uh, to point out here is that when you look historically about this area that we're talking about, psychic phenomena, that scientific progress is very slow. Every advancement is absurdly controversial. And this is a book that, that came out a, a month or two ago in which I talk about all of these topics in a lot more and great gory detail. And in particular, I spend a fair amount of time talking about why we know from a scientific perspective that some of the lore of, from yoga is correct. So, was Buddha just a nice guy? Well, maybe he was a nice guy. I, I don't really know, but in terms of was he a nice guy and maybe something more? I think the answer is yes, that some of the stories about him were probably embellished. The hagiography about the saints and our religious figures are always embellished. But some of what was written about him was probably right. And that may be one of the reasons why the religious teachings persist, because there's a certain degree of authenticity that is carried by these figures. Uh, making a, a clean discrimination between uh, what was written and said about these religious figures versus what science can say about them. We're still very far apart at this point. But the kind of research that, that I do and that I'm, I'm interested in is looking at, in principle, whether or any of these supernormal abilities that are talked about in our stories, are they, are they true? And the answer appears to be yes. They're, they're true, some of them. So when you study this, this realm, basically what you're doing is uh, you're doing something like this, where you're looking through the telescope and you're trying to figure out what's going on. And the further you pull back on all this, you get further and further away. You find out that basically everything I've just been talking about is it's like on a microscope slide. And we can expand out and we find that we're consciousness studying ourselves. 
And it's always very difficult for a system to study itself because you're never going to be fully inclusive. We do the best we can, as any area of science does, uh, and we are learning slowly uh, in some interesting things. Uh, but I think I'll finish on that note, and uh, thank you for your kind attention. Uh, so I see that there's uh, some comments. Nelly, did did you uh, should we take questions? How do you want to handle it from this point? Uh, can you hear me? Because I'm not sure. You're still screen sharing. You can't hear I can. me. I can. Hear it, yes. oh, okay. I I can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Should I go back to your screen? Make it uh, a bit easier. Okay. Let me close this. All right, uh, there. All right, so yes, um, thank you so much. Um, I was just going through the book as you were talking, and I noticed that, yes, everything's right in the book. So um, great. That was uh, really wonderful yep. for me because I haven't started it yet. I'm just uh, going to. Are there any questions? Um, I don't know if you noticed the chat box. I can see the chat box. Okay. Yeah, I can um, see the chat box. If you could just add. <clears throat> I see a couple of people applauding. Thank you. Uh, there were some skeptics um, who feel that uh, they're not sure. And I liked your last statement, which kind of answers it. So how do you feel about it when it comes to, um, to all of this? Putting away your scientific uh, experiments, do you have a personal sense of of all this? It's often thought that uh, because this is an unusual area for a scientist to get into that uh, I, I must have had a lot of psychic experiences as a youth or maybe my family did or somebody but there wasn't any. I don't ever remember as a child anyone talking about anything psychic or mystical and so I think the, the, uh, maybe the reason why I'm interested in this is because I, no one in my family is, started out as a scientist. I, I mean, my immediate family, there are no scientists at all. Uh, I started out as, as a musician. I was a violinist for many years. Uh, and I was also good at uh, mathematics and electronics, so I got a couple of degrees in electrical engineering and later got on, uh, went on to get my PhD in psychology. And as Maybe as a result of, uh, of looking at lots of different disciplines, uh, I, and I never felt that uh, the scientific explanation for things was sufficient. In some cases it is. When you can turn something into a technology, like the technology that is allowing us to do this today, you know, that's undeniable. It's, that's a real thing. The science underneath that works quite well. But there are lots of other things about the human behavior and human experiences that psychology is struggling to understand. And the one that is the biggest mystery of all is the, the sense of awareness itself. Why, how, how is it that we can be aware? So I always was struck by this, this question. And in addition, uh, since I was, I was probably a little better than average on the violin, uh, that my teachers and my parents would oftentimes say, you're not living up to your potential. And I'm thinking, this is as a kid, I'm thinking, well, I practice an hour a day, sometimes two hours a day on the violin. And I was a concert master of my orchestra, and I'm thinking, what else can I do? What is my potential? If I could figure out what my potential was, then I could tell my teachers, yes, I am working up to my potential. So this was an issue that I, I, I struggled with for 20 years. What is, what is my potential? So naturally I began to look into the literature to find out what, what, what is human potential, what are the limits of human potential. And I, f I found that uh, in many cases we are limited by what we believe to be so. That's what our, this is one of the reasons why it's hard to know what your potential is. It doesn't seem to stop. One of, the, one of the areas then that struck my curiosity was psychic experience, primarily because it is amenable to being studied through scientific means. And that's what captured me. Uh, it was that combined with the opportunity to do this kind of research for the US government 
where I had the opportunity to work with uh, some people who are exceptionally talented remote viewers, otherwise known as clairvoyants. They were really, really good at what they did. And it became very clear to me very quickly that we're dealing with real phenomena here and phenomena that science has almost completely overlooked or dismissed or don't look at at all. So after, after working in this field for a while, I had to make a decision. Why would I, why would I want to work on, on uh, conventional topics when this is such a gigantic mystery basically staring us in the face, uh, which the implications are very important because they tell us something about who we are, what our capacities are, what our potential is, uh, and also where some of our scientific assumptions are wrong. So I'm, I'm now convinced after many years of study in this area that some aspects of the neurosciences are incorrect in terms of their assumptions. Some aspects of physics are incorrect in terms of those assumptions. I think it's important for us to figure out where the assumptions are wrong, uh, how to make them better, and as a result, the one hopes that with better information, we can all make better decisions about about our future and about ourselves. So that's kind of a, a long-winded answer to your question on uh, and, and how did I get involved in all this. Thank you. I noticed that others asked the same question. Um, have you uh, at any point felt that no more? Okay, um, this is something that is not going to go very far, and um, I'm going to look for something else. Is there something else beyond uh, consciousness that you'd like to go into? Something beyond consciousness? Something something beyond else con consciousness? That is not. Uh, really scientific that you would like to explore or is it really really scientific let me figure out um, you know if I can figure out what this is something that's not scientific you mentioned art music well I, yeah I, I have a, a meditation practice uh, for me the practice is not so much it's not a spiritual practice per se uh, it's primarily because after doing so much research on the uh, the medical benefits the health uh, mental and physical health benefits of meditation I simply decided that it was important to do in the same sense that you would do physical exercise it, it doing meditation is, is very important for health reasons and for me, it has made a, a big difference. I'm, I'm much calmer. I feel a lot better simply by meditating. So I think it's an important thing to do. Uh, but my, I'm driven in this case by, uh, by the, the scientific puzzle of this. It's the curiosity of how can it be that we have people, uh, roughly 60% of the population worldwide, that talks about these kinds of phenomena all the time. And so we either are faced with a lot of people who are delusional, which is possible, or we're faced with uh, a phenomena which is real that we don't understand yet. And so that's the, that's the reason why scientists are involved in what they're doing. They, they're pulled by curiosity and interesting puzzles. And of course, in this case, the puzzle is not simply that it's a puzzle, but it tells us something important about who and what we are. And I think everybody's always interested in those questions, including me. Thank you. Um, do you think that perhaps um, meditation has anything to do with it? I think you mentioned it um, in some of your work that uh, people who meditate, is it true that they tend to have more of these experiences? Yes. When you, you look at correlations between meditative practice and reports of psychic phenomena, the correlation is extremely significant. The more you meditate, the more you have these phenomena. What that does, what the correlation doesn't tell us though is, is it the meditation that's doing it? Or is it the type of temperament that some people are simply drawn more to, to introspection and to meditative practice? And that same temperament is the kind that tends to report these kinds of phenomena. 
that connection is not clear. I do spend a chapter in my book, though, talking about is there any evidence that improved performance in psychic tasks is correlated with, um, with greater uh, meditative experience? And the answer is yes. The more you practice meditation, the more likely you are to, to have these experiences, and they are correlated. And by the way, the reason why I mention that is because this is essentially what the, the point is made by Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras. So you sit down and you meditate with, with discipline long enough, you will begin to experience these phenomena. That's why he mentions them in the book. So mindfulness uh, is one of the ways... Not necessarily yoga. Yoga is completely different from mindfulness. Uh, do you practice yoga or just mindfulness? Sorry. Well, the, in traditional sense, yoga actually is meditation. I mean, it, it's, there's the eightfold path in classical yoga, but the, the majority of the of the point of yoga is to meditate. The, the style of meditation is somewhat different. I mean, like Raja meditation, the Royal Road meditation. There's lots of different paths that people use today. Uh, I think there's probably, I mean, there's more and more research now on different styles of meditation. Um, a good, medi a good. I mean, one way, even thinking about the physical uh, aspects of yoga is that it's a movement meditation. It's a body meditation. So I don't make a strong distinction between sitting and doing nothing except in your head versus doing some kind of movement along with it. Because classical yoga is not just as asanas or postures and not just sitting meditation. It's also about behavior. It's about developing ethics, about morality, about withdrawing the senses. I mean, it's a whole, a whole thing. So, so I don't, I, I mean, in terms of, of the difference between mindfulness, for example, and mantra meditation, people ask, is one type of meditation better than another? I would say that it depends on your temperament. Some people do a lot better with one versus another method, uh, but ultimately, I think they all end up in the same place. You 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 begin to transcend your your uh, surface mind after a while, and I'm pretty sure that uh, regardless of the me the method that is being used, that uh, ultimately people do end up in the same place. Thank you, thank you so much. I don't see any questions. Oh, there is a question. Uh, by John Davey. He asks if uh, simple affirmations can achieve success and change, then what else is possible? I don't see limits on the answer. I don't know if that's a question. Do you see that? Well, yeah, I see that. Yeah, I, well, I would agree. Uh, it's possible that the, uh, what, what are the limits to human potential? I think that the limits are our imagination. That's what we're limited by. And, and unfortunately, I see this more often than I'd, I like to see, uh, that you, you get people writing articles saying, well, this is clearly impossible because of these reasons. And I'm, th I'm thinking while I'm reading these that these people have, they have a medical condition called uh, imagination deficit syndrome. That they simply are not able to imagine beyond this uh, tiny little constrained way of thinking about the universe. And we think about the, the expanse of the universe and how young the human species is and how even younger that science is, we hardly know anything. I mean, the, the technology that we're using now is, and geological time has appeared in a flash. You know, we're all amazed that we're able to do this and it is a wonderful infrastructure. But we're just beginning as a species. We're, we're still very adolescent, even we're, you know, we're before adolescence, we're infants. And we're we're playing with ideas, and we, we have I I'm a strong advocate of saying push imagination as far as you can go, and then keep pushing because it That's doesn't great. end. That's a great thought um, to end the session. Uh, let the imagination go, and um, and go beyond that too. Thank you, thank you so much for um, for coming and for for giving us so much um, a lot to think about. Many of uh, the participants are going straight to bed, so I, I think they'll have great dreams. <laughs> I hope they will, and um, and open up their imaginations. So thank you. 
Good. Have have good dreams then for those of you who are about to go to sleep. Thank you so much, uh, Dean, and I'm looking forward to okay. uh, hearing more from you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.